Welcome back to Challenges of Faith. I'm Gary McCants, and thank you for joining. Our guest tonight is Brother Ronald Clay. You know, recently, Brother Clay's personal story was featured by Moody Bible Institute, a school I am very familiar with in Chicago, Illinois. It was titled Set Free from Prison to Seminary. I also want to thank the MBI family for assisting in the coordination of having Brother Ronald Clay on tonight, because it's an honor to have him here, to fellowship with him, and to see what God is up to in his life. Brother Clay, how are you doing tonight? I'm all right. How are you doing, Brother Gary? It's good. Nice to uh, uh, talk to you again. Appreciate you having me on the show. Yes, sir. And 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 most importantly, how's your family? Uh, my family is doing well. Uh, me and my wife, being married 141 days today, um, oh. are doing great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't remember nothing else, you better remember how many days. But go ahead, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, actually, while while being here at Moody Bible Institute, I had an elder who kept track of the days, and he's been married uh, 52 years. And I said, wow, you keep track of the days, huh? He has been 18,000 certain days. And I said, why? He says, because every day I'm intentionally aware of what's taking place, how my wife is, and where I need to be. And he encouraged me to do it. So he said every time he sees me, He's going to ask me how many days I've been married. So I don't see him often because he stays in Florida. So, I, so when he sees me, I got to know how many days and just let me know, let him know that I'm being intentional about my marriage. So, I, yeah, 141 days. and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. something that I do. God bless you with your soulmate. He bless you with your yes. soulmate. Absolutely. All right. Story within itself. Well, Brother Clay, this is your program tonight. And so we start off, and again, you share whatever God through the Holy Spirit has laid on your heart. But you grew up where, and was your dad and mom present? Uh, yes, sir. I was uh, grew up in Chicago, uh, and uh, by Chicago, the city, and in the south suburbs. Uh, my father is from uh, Inglewood, and so time he had me being the oldest. I was in Inglewood for a little bit before he moved us to the south suburbs, and uh, which was a blessing within itself uh, because of the diversity of people and things that I was um, exposed to at an early age helped me in my upbringing, and my father was very intentional about that. So uh, my dad in my life growing up, and, um, and that was a blessing that I didn't realize it was until I got older. Mm-hmm. I understand that, uh, uh, well, I ha- I'm i blessed to have had a, uh, an administrative uh, person assigned to me, and, and there was an uh, assistant uh, a director who, uh, he, he would call her, and uh, they would always be laughing and giggling and talking, and so... Uh, one day I recognized that both of them were were PK kids, and I understand that you were a PK. <laughs> and for the audience who may not know, that's a preacher's child, a preacher's kid. And how was it growing up as a child of a pastor? Uh, it was um, in my household. It, it wasn't. It, it was. It was. It was good. It was good. There was structure in my household. Uh, outside and dealing with different people, uh, they expected you to act a certain way, uh, be a certain way because of coming up in that household that we that I did. Uh, but it, it was uh, it was good. It was good. My mom and my dad were as parents, uh, great parents uh, with the good and bad, and um, uh, just being a preacher's kid was. <laughs> It, it was what it was, you know. Mm-hmm. That was a dyna- that was a dynamic in my household. So, mm-hmm. and not only that, I went to church. My grandfather was a pastor, and my my dad was up mm-hmm. under my grandfather. So, that was another dynamic within itself. So, I had other cousins who were related, who we went to the same church and, and same school, and it was 
was a, it was an interesting dynamic. Mm-hmm. You know, <clears throat> when you look at the Word and <clears throat> the Word of God, and you see the genealogies and so forth, and and then uh, you recognize when you think of uh, uh, David's lineage and Solomon's lineage and so forth and so forth. And a lot of times um, when we bring it to what we're talking about now, a lot of times we don't recognize the lineages of, of where we came from in terms of who was really who. And especially as it relates to what you're sharing now about uh, the grandfather and so forth from the pastoral standpoint. And then again, what we've started off with tonight so far, listeners, is the fact that, you know, um, we're talking about family. We're talking about uh, uh, soulmates. We're talking about keeping uh, uh, the days, how uh, how how long one has been together as partners. And when I say partners, I'm talking about husband and wives, wives and husbands. Mm -hmm. And now we're talking Mm -hmm. about the fact that, um, you know, society may have, around the globe, not just in the United States, that um, uh, that there are not uh, two parents in a household. And there may not be, but at the same time, there are two parents in a household. And then um, you have to recognize that. And there are no perfect families nowhere on the globe. And so, therefore, this is where we are. Uh, Brother Clay, why did you find yourself rebelling? And were there any influences from friends or so-called friends? Uh, any influence from friends? I, from the time coming up, I was trying to find myself, you know, whether it was playing sports where I fit in um, or playing sports, whether it was uh, being a musician where I fit in as a musician. In my household, where did I fit in as a young man? Um, as the eldest, um, uh, as a black man in the suburbs at the time when we moved out there, it was uh, predominantly uh, white. Um, and then, you know, going back to the city where it's uh, predominantly black and how I fit in and the different structures of society coming up as an adolescent um, in my mind trying to frame who am I? You know, where do I fit in and where my parents um, thought I should be and the standards and things that were set of what I was supposed to live up to. Um, Coming up in the household, my my, my dad always told me, son, you have a calling on your life and you have a pre you you're you're going to be a a great preacher, a speaker and a, and a worker for the kingdom. And me being a musician, that's not what I had for my life. (laughs) <laughs> my father, my father would often uh, take me with him. I had two uh, sisters and one brother, and he would take me with him when he went and preached. And he would tell me things about how I should carry myself as a preacher, uh, as a minister. And I'd be like, you know, it's good information to have. But I'm like, why are you telling me this? This is not something that <laughs> I want to do and it's something that, that, you know, I don't look to be doing in the future, but – Okay, I'll listen to him. Like he he would tell me, "Hey, son, uh, when somebody gets up to preach, don't preach after them. They actually get words and sit, get up, say thank you, and sit down. Um, things like that. You know, when you you go in, respect the pastor in this way. I'm like, well, yeah, all right. You know, I, I want to learn, you know, musicianship and things of that matter. And it was just so off the bat, right away. You know, having that, I, I didn't want that. You know, like sometimes we will want things and then it's what God has for us. And I didn't know uh, personally what it meant to submit to the will of God uh, as Mm -hmm. opposed to wanting my own will in my life. And Mm -hmm. because of that, I made it my business to do the opposite of what my parents or people would think that I would. Because my dad was a great preacher and he was a great student of the word. And he carried himself a certain way, and he was well respected in the uh, community up here in the ministry in, in Chicago and beyond. And he was greatly respected amongst family members and um, uh, church, you know, the, the church community. And they look to me, and they, you know, they hear him, and they get to, this is my son, and they, they question me, "Well, you you up coming up as him, huh? You 
you know, you the next in line. I'm like, man, look, I'm trying to be the best drummer, pianist, uh, basketball, football player I can be. And, you know, being a preacher was something that was just like far from my mind. But, you know, that rebellion started out with them and God having something for me and me not wanting that and running mm-hmm. from that. Mm-hmm. How about the influences from friends or so-called friends? Uh, Well, I had some cousins and some friends in the city as I was coming up that fell in line with how I wanted to be and what I wanted for my life, meaning mm-hmm. that anything opposite of what God and my dad wanted for me and what the structure is that fell in line with what I wanted. So um, hanging out with people maybe I should have been hanging out with and the influences of the streets that I did not have to be a part of, but what I chose to be a part of, uh, mm. the influences of, of um, uh, and then smoking and weed came along with that. And then the, uh, having sex outside of marriage, uh, mm-hmm. um, serial fornication came along with that. Mm-hmm. And then uh, me wanting to be, you know, angry or uh, wanting to, uh, but but let me let me just say this though. Let me say this. I always knew, and the people always knew that <laughs> I was out of out of my element. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll be I'll be in an environment. I give you an instance. I give you an example. I'll be in an environment of people who were on. I mean, not on the street, but street street dudes. I'll be out there hanging around street dudes doing me, trying to be a part of what they're a part of. Mm-hmm. And one, one time we was out shooting dice and they were smoking weed. And here I am in the corner. I pull out my Wall Street Journal and <laughs> I'm reading and I'm circling things and they're looking over there like, what, what is going on? Or oh, I pull out uh, Charles Dickens while I'm smoking a blunt. <laughs> and, <laughs> and read and they just knew it was something different, you know, the way I, mm-hmm. you know, carry myself being out there with them, you know, they'll mm-hmm. be like, Hey, let's do this. Let's do that. And I'm like, Oh, let's think about this. Let's go about it this way. Let's do this. Let's do that. And they were like, wait, man, this, it's not, it was just different. And I knew, mm-hmm. but I was trying to uh, suppress who I truly was to be mm-hmm. about what I wanted to become. And I had mm-hmm. no problems in putting myself in situations and, um, uh, things of uh, people who uh, of whom I wanted to emulate. I never forget. Mm-hmm. I was in a car. I was in a car, um, and I was smoking. I was smoking with this guy who was. We was on the block together. We hung out, and mm-hmm. you know we were getting high. And he said, "Why are you doing this?" Mm-hmm. And I said, "I said, what you mean?" <laughs> he said, "He said if I had the family that you had, I'd never be out here." It was mm-hmm. other people that recognized the blessings that I had, and I didn't. Mm-hmm. That's right. And and that just, like, floored me at that point. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow. And here's a guy who was out there game banking, who was out there doing hustling because he had to. Mm-hmm. And he felt like he had to. He didn't have a father. He didn't even mm-hmm. have a mother. Mother was on drugs. Mm-hmm. Uh, he dropped out of school. And all he had was what he knew of the streets. That wasn't my life. Mm-hmm. I was with them, and it was. It, I didn't. I wasn't from a, where they were from, but mm-hmm. I was. I moved from the neighborhood, mm-hmm. but I still wanted to be connected to that neighborhood. Mm-hmm. You know, my dad intentionally moved us out, and so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So that the impressionable me seeking things that you know I knew that I shouldn't have been a part of later on. Uh, those mm-hmm. friends and those those outside influences was just uh, something that I, I sought after. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Listeners, you're hearing from Brother Ronald Clay. You hear him talk about the fact that his dad, his beloved dad, was trying to give him some sound advice, especially as it relates to presenting the message. And, of course, Brother Clay had his own mind going in the way that he wanted to go. And that's what God would have us to do here. He gives us that free volition up to a point. And then Brother Clay is talking about the influences from friends or so-called friends. But notice how God had somebody there trying to remind him 
of who he really was and is in God. And that's interesting for all of us as believers of the household of faith, no matter how we try to fit in, we are the light on that hill. And I always share with people that when a believer goes into a room, irrespective of what their room is, that those who don't know the Lord that you're serving, they know who you are. Brother Clay, what college did you attend and graduate from? Uh, well, uh, my first year out of college, I went to uh, Prairie View A&M University. Mm. Um, yeah, right. uh, that was, I, I spent a year down there uh, mm. intentionally, uh, wanted to play uh, on the football and basketball team. Uh, didn't have quite the grades in the uh, ACT score, so I had to red shirt. But my cousin was down there. He played on the team. And I went down there on my own. And, again, that's the story. But I was down there for a year. Uh, mm-hmm. Came back after taking about uh, seven months off uh, traveling. Went to Moraine Valley Community College. I uh, got my AA. Then I went to um, University of St. Francis. Mm-hmm. And I finished my undergrad in psychology there. Mm-hmm. What happened to alter your plans for your life? What happened to alter my plans for my life? Yes, sir. Uh, the the turning point. Wow. Fast forward to alter my plans for my life. The turning point was when I was in prison. Um, there was a lot that led up to me being in prison, um, a lot mm-hmm. that led up to that. Uh, God was showing me some things, and I was still running. I was still running. Mm-hmm. And the more the more and more I started to run away, it felt like my legs was stuck in quicksand. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was in mud. I couldn't run very far, and I started to get deeper and deeper into the things that I was running to and away from. Mm-hmm. And it got to the, the, the it got to the point where that um, I was in prison. Uh, that my father died. Um, that I turned away from. Um, that was just like the cherry on on top. It was just too much. With everything that came to a head, everything that was going on in my life, the turning point for me was that when I realized that I couldn't do anything else on my own. Mm-hmm. I couldn't go any further. The more and more I was seeking to do things that um, on my own, I mm-hmm. couldn't. I just fell to my knees, and it was just... It was that point in time after I found out the death of my father while I was incarcerated was a turning Mm -hmm. point away from where I was going to where I needed to head towards Christ. Mm -hmm. Listeners, Brother Ronald Clay is sharing his thoughts about being in prison. We're headed toward that story. But he had his own plans for his life. You've heard him briefly talk about it. And then something happened. He, out of fellowship with God, committed a crime. The question, being out of right relationship with God, that should cause all of us to think about it. Were you afraid? And then... The question is, for any and all of us, why not? Because we're learning that there were consequences that Brother Ronald is going to talk about. He's in a prison. He now has a 10-year sentence over him. And now in there, he has these thoughts, emotional thoughts. Now, listeners, think about what we've been talking about so far talking about family, talking about partner, talking about school, talking about street, talking about friends, so-called friends, talking about rebelling, talking about not listening, talking about having a plan, talking about college. And then 
Life takes a change. Future takes a change. God is still in control. So, Brother Clay, you, you, now you're inside. Any problems with your fellow inmates? And how was prison life for you and those persons affected by you being there, as you just mentioned about today? Um. A lot of the issues, problems that I had in prison were self-inflicted. It was because of, you know, me being me. Um, before God before God came into my life, I was in and out of the hole, um, getting in fights and confrontation, um, you know. And there were people that were put in prison to, uh, you know, God, I believe, watch over me and give me a, a sense of direction. And I even didn't want to listen to uh, too often because I was trying to do my own thing. And, um, there were a couple of people who uh, I believe negatively and positively they affected because uh, that, that prison door has a revolving door. I mean, there are people who are coming and going, whether they're being transferred or whether they're being um, uh, starting their sentences or ending their sentences and they're getting released. And some people I had short encounters with, others I had uh, I was there with my whole bit, uh, or I knew for a long time, long period of time. Um, and I think that I, you know, negatively or positively affected, you know, those who were around me from you know, people I got in fights with, uh, um, people I got in trouble with, went to the hole with, uh, COs and inmates, uh, you know. Um, uh, again, I tried to be to myself, and then I found myself being uh, with a group of people, uh, and it, it was uh, it was interesting. It was, it was, you know what? I learned a whole lot. I learned a whole lot in prison, and the whole prison experience was a learning experience that positively uh, affected my life uh, on what and how I need to move forward. Um, so. Uh, I did, when I did get saved and God saved me, uh, I asked, I told God that I wanted to work for the kingdom. And he told me, you know, and so much in reading the word and giving me a revelation in my heart that, you know, you want to work until you get out to work for the kingdom, but you got work for me to do that you can do here in prison. There are people who need to be set free. Like I said, you free. There are people who are set free, who needs direction and needs the word. And, Right away, I stopped running, and I started having, I believe, a positively, a positive effect uh, on people at that period of time. Um, uh, God allowed me to start uh, um, Bible studies in prison. I started uh, prayer groups I was a part of that grew to about 20 people at one time. Every time they had count, last count of the night, we would go back. And have a about five to ten minute reading of the word, and we'll have fellowship and prayer. It was a good group of brothers who came together who who knew the Lord that you know wanted to be a part of that. Uh, um, and then uh, you know I had a, in my heart that I wanted to help uh, the the inmates who were in there with me uh, prepare themselves as much as possible to when they get out they can have uh, you know start off on the right foot. So I started, um, I had a couple panel discussions on how to bring it into society. I, uh, I had a, I never forget, I had this, um, I went to the head of recreation, and I told him, like, because uh, at the time, when on my way out, when I was going to get released, there was when Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton, that, that election in 2016. And I heard a lot of people talking about that election, and, um, and it was feel like that people were misinformed. They were only going on what they hear on the news or what people were discussing instead of doing research. But our our, our resources were limited in prison, so we uh, had limited resources to do our research. So uh, the recreational officer allowed me to start a uh, history of uh, election and voting one-on-one. I did my mm-hmm. research. I drew up a syllabus. And I had a class teaching about the history of the Republic of the United States of America. I, I loved history. Um, mm-hmm. And 
while I was in there, we had the first, I think, federal uh, election, um, wow. mock election, mock election. Mm-hmm. So I was teaching mm-hmm. people how to vote, um, mm-hmm. what priorities they should put into place to when they go and vote, um, mm-hmm. what things are important to them. Uh, I help people to, you know, it's federal prison for people all over, from all over the country. So mm-hmm. we were able to have a mock mock election and mock registration. So showing people how to register to vote and how to vote. And we actually had a voting in prison. And in that election, mm-hmm. Hillary Clinton won that election mm-hmm. <laughs> in prison. Uh, uh, but people told me, like, man, you know, Ryan, uh, thanks for helping me to realize certain things about the voting process, the election process. Mm-hmm. And people didn't know about the uh, electoral college. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, uh, so, you know, people putting their priorities in line, uh, was going to vote one way before the class and after the class, most of the class was voting another way because they felt like they learned uh, how to go about voting when you go to the uh, to the ballots. What's the proper mm-hmm. way to vote instead of being influenced by the outside? So a, uh, I was able to start a, um, a fundraiser in prison, people mm-hmm. in prison raising funds for those outside of prison for a backpack program. We was able to raise two thousand dollars for that for that uh mm-hmm. program. So it was when God started to work in me and I allowed the spirit to work in me open up and my possibilities mm-hmm. that I was able to do and the positive influence I'll be able to have on my environment and the people around me. And God opened up when I started to allow the spirit to work. He started to give me favor with the warden, favor mm-hmm. with COs, favor with mm-hmm. inmates, and I was able to be free while I start still incarcerated. So, right. yeah, and so God started to work with me, but with all that I was doing, he told me, you know what, this is just practice because I have <laughs> work for you to do when you get out. <laughs> you know, this is just a run through, so just – you know, hold your horses. So uh, that was very true. That was very true. So listeners, you're hearing from brother brother Ronald Clay, who is sharing his sojourn, just a tidy bit of the sojourn, because you'd have to have been there walking along with him in order to experience all that he went through. But he started off sharing as relates to while in there, about his beloved dad, the same father, who was trying to give him sound advice, who he recognized cared also for his life. You know, parents oftentimes, as we know it to be, also have their own plan and purpose for your life. But Brother Clay also spoke of how God used him while being incarcerated. He talked about the fact that God gave him favor, and that's what God will do. You know, in the word, it lets you know that, you know, God has control even over the king's heart. They can't do no more than what God would have them to do. But we as believers of the household of faith must understand that, you know, our faith is in God and recognizing that he can do whatever he wants to do. A lot of times he's just waiting on us to do just what Brother Clay is saying, surrender. We're going to take a break, and when we return, we're going to talk about surrendering to God, but not from my perspective, but from Brother Ronald Clay's perspective. We're talking about how does a person go from being a rebellious PK, preacher's kid, to a rebellious federal prisoner, and then suddenly change in their life? How can that be? How in the world did Ronald Clay end up at Moody Bible Institute and as a third-year seminary student, and I'm going to add on, also counting the days in which he and his soulmate have been. Welcome back to Challenges of Faith. I'm Gary McCants. Our guest tonight is Ronald Clay, Moody Bible Institute, third-year seminary student. You know, Brother Clay was sharing, before he went to break, he was sharing how God had used him while being incarcerated to be able to provide knowledge. In essence, he took some cookies from the top shelf and brought them down so that they were clear. 
You know, the word of God, you know, we were talking about how that all scripture is not to you, but you can apply it, that which is applicable. You know, when the scripture talks about, you know, our people perishes for lack of knowledge, it's not talking about it the way in which a lot of people, including behind the pulpit, may be using it. But, you know, when we talk about it from this perspective, here God used Brother Clay to be able to take the society's knowledge. Because a lot of people won't do their independent research for them. They'll go off of everybody's word rather than learning for themselves, similar to what we know to be when studying the word of God. But here God used Brother Clay to teach, to help individuals learn for themselves. And that was a prelude to where he is today. Brother Clay, when you speak of surrendering to God, and for the listeners or actually other PK kids who may not understand, how did you surrender to God? Um, well, it was how I... Um... I gave it all up. I couldn't do it on my own anymore. My own power, under my own flesh, under my own reasoning, my own knowledge, my own understanding, my own direction, my own will, it it got me nowhere. And I'm so grateful that my father planted that seed in me that when I got to that point, most people turned to suicide or, or worse to get them in other positions to get out of the way of the world because they no longer want to live or, or or continue on. I knew that there was somebody that I can turn to. There was something that my father taught me that I was rebelled against, that I rebelled against, that I can go to and and give it all to him. Um Give him my burden uh, Give him uh, My issues, my problems Because I knew that he was The solution And when I found out My father had died uh, The way I found out In prison also uh, By email um, And not somebody telling me uh, And then I had found out My father had tried to reach me uh, My family Mm -hmm. Before he died um, along with everything that I was dealing with in prison, going through self-inflicted. Um, actually, I had just gotten out the hole at that time, too. And it was just me looking at the amount of time that I had left. The clock was going so slow. Oh, man, it was it, it was just a combination of things, and it just came to a head. And I actually dropped to my knees on that track as I was walking the track. And... I started crying over my father and over where I was and how I was feeling. I let my emotions run over me, and I just told him I I gave up. I gave up trying to fight this fight of life I couldn't do it on my own. And I just said, I give it all to you. Forgive me. Save me. Deliver me. And keep me. And take it from here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I said the the uh, prayer of salvation um, mm-hmm. that was in my heart, mm-hmm. and when I was done, and when I had gotten up, there was a sense of urgency and determination in my heart, and God opened up the door for me to draw closer to Him. God opened mm-hmm. up the pathway. Uh, they were all The funny part is it was always there I just didn't notice it mm-hmm. I didn't I wasn't, I wasn't aware of it And that's That's how I went from Point A to point B In my relationship with God Praise God You know a lot of times And I try to share that with uh, uh, Those that God would have me to Especially believers you know, the word is very clear. We have three enemies, the flesh, the world, and mm. the devil. And ain't no way in the world mm. the devil wants us to see at the same time, and we always are conscious of that. But Brother Ronald, Brother Ronald, why did you desire to read and study the word of God and to be used of God 
And did God ever answer your prayers to be used for him and how? When I got saved, uh, I told him I wanted to work for the kingdom, as I had stated before. And what I went on what I knew and what my father taught me and what I was listening to. And like I said, one pathway started opening up um, was the Moody Radio. There was somebody in prison uh, who told me they listened to a Christian radio station. And I wanted to be fed. You know, I work out, and I worked out a lot in prison. And one thing you do when you work out, you got to feed your muscles in order to grow and for your muscles to heal. And that's a spiritual um, discernment. That's a spiritual uh, aspect to that also. You know, we we fight on a daily basis, the spirits, the principalities, the um, those uh, demons and in high places. And mm-hmm. it's t- it's tiring, and those spiritual muscles need to be fed. The only way they can be fed mm-hmm. is through the Word of God. And mm-hmm. I would listen and be fed in the morning, all day with like Erwin Lutzer, uh, with uh, mm-hmm. Tony Evans, with Jay Vernon mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. with um, uh, Oliver Green and um, mm-hmm. Charles Stanley. It was mm-hmm. Greg Laurie. It was hit after hit. And I was mm-hmm. listening to the word, and they would feed me and feed me to get me through the day until that next day that I, I'm able to get up and hear the word again. Mm-hmm. And because of that, what that did was instill in me from what I heard to go and study and read the word for myself mm-hmm. to get an understanding, a further understanding of what they were telling me or what I was listening to on the radio. So... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, by me listening to certain things, Bible teaching that Jay Brother McGee would give me, I will open up the Bible and just learn, take notes, learn, take notes, read, take notes, learn, read, study. And that's something that was instilled in me that I wanted to do. If In order to know mm-hmm. God, I wanted to know God. It would be best to know God's word. Mm-hmm. And uh, he opened up the door for me to do that. So I... From there, it was instilled in me based on me re- listening to the radio and opening up the word that I needed more, I wanted more out of it. And that's how I got in touch with the word and wanted to uh, be more entrenched in, in, in the word of God. Mm-hmm. So listeners, as you're hearing from Brother Ronald Clay, he's sharing with you, just like you exercise for the muscles he needed, the word of God. For spiritual growth, individuals he listened to, the same that I listened to. But most importantly, he began to grow, and God is causing that growth to continue to occur. You know, I'm reminded of a brother, uh, a beloved brother by the name of Rick, who uh, we were over in Wheaton, and then uh, uh, for his purpose, and we went over to Moody. And I remember being at a uh, stop sign that I, I share this story. And I remember having the audacity to pray and ask God to use me for your glory. I'll go with you. Tell me to go. Do what you tell me to do. Man, I tell people now, don't you pray that prayer? Because a part of that prayer is you're going to go through some trials, some trials, some trials that the pastor never told you about or your instructor Mm -hmm. never told you about. Brother Ron, how did your spiritual growth impact your fellow inmates, because now they're they're seeing you spiritually, mentally, and physically free. How did it impact their lives? Uh, you would never know until somebody comes and tells you. I mean, you can be mm-hmm. doing a lot. Uh, there's a story uh, that somebody told me that it was this guy who was standing out, passing out tracks all the time, and Nobody would ever come to salvation. And he was mm-hmm. outside passing tracks out. And it wasn't until his funeral where he had thousands of people who found out that he died. And That's he cool. never knew. But the seeds that he sold, that he, uh, he she sold, uh, it's up to God to give the increase. But there were right. a, a, couple of, a couple of guys who told me that they were either influenced on how I dealt, how I carried myself. Uh, how mm-hmm. I dealt with uh, authority, how I dealt with other pe- people. Um, and I wasn't perfect because I 
had that uh, in me that when I faced with certain things, I would react in a certain way. And it would take somebody to come come to me and told me. i never forget one thing I played, one, thing, one scene that I did in prison that I did a lot of. I played a lot of chess. I read a lot mm-hmm. of books. I lifted a lot of weights. And I played a lot of chess. And somebody had said something to me. And this, I was saved. Mm-hmm. I knew the Lord. And I cussed him out quick. It was in <laughs> saying something. I said something like, boom. <laughs> The brother sitting the brother sitting across from me. The brother sitting across from me, he said, Hey Ron, you know God. Mm-hmm. And the other people, the only God that they know is in you. You That's shouldn't right. be cussing. He said you shouldn't That's be cussing. Right. Now I could have mm-hmm. cussed him out by telling me who you talking to. I say what I want to mm-hmm. say. But mm-hmm. one thing about the spirit is it convicts you. That's right. It convicts you. And I didn't That's rebuke right. him. I didn't mm-hmm. rebuke him because what he said, I had peace because he, I was, he was right. That's he right. was right. I said to myself, uh, "Wow, I need to be more aware and conscious of how I do things and the way I do things because there are people watching me and I represent something bigger and greater than me." That's right. And the uh, so the question is, uh, although my walk may have had a lot of influence on people, which it did. I, I believe I pay more attention to the influence that people had on me to get me where God needed to be. That's right. I, I pay more attention to that. But in answering your question, you know, there was a guy, it was a couple of people who came to me and told me, you know, thank you. Or, you know what, Ron, you the real deal. Or and I, I can't take the credit for that at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At all, it was the God in me, an opportunity that God presented me to be able to make that change. For mm-hmm. me to allow the Spirit to work in me to to change the things that needed to be changed. Mm-hmm. So now, Brother Ron is growing, and and what he uh, the example he used with the person as it relates to their funeral, uh, there was an example that Doctor McGee used one time where. It was this individual who happened to be black and the individual who happened to be white and and the individual who happened to be white was giving out some religious tracts and and uh, the individual who happened to be black told him, that, no, thank you, I'll just watch yours. And what he was saying is that rather than see what you're talking about, just watch what you do. And here what Brother Ronald Clay is talking about, here God used another person in his life, this time incarcerated to pull a string and say, now recognize, remember who you are, like the gentleman who, while out there playing, uh, out there in the streets and so forth, uh, when Brother Ron had to take out that Wall Street Journal and so forth and doing other things, <laughs> God had somebody else there reminding him. So now Brother Ron is now himself feeling spiritually, mentally, and physically free. And he's talking about reading other types of books. So, Brother Ron, what are the types of books where you're reading from a business planning standpoint and why? Business planning. Um, uh, I read, uh, there was this individual, again, somebody else who had influence. Uh, he was a pastor of a mega church in Indiana, and um, he was incarcerated. He fell uh, in leadership, and he had repented, and he was uh, on his way, you know, on his way back to Christ. And he said, Ron, he was a prominent preacher. He was a very, very, very smart man. He said, Ron, there's a leader in you, and you have a gift of speaking and a gift of being able to talk to people, no matter whether they're in the boardroom or they're in the streets, they're in prison or in school or educated. You have a uh, way of going about where is that they you can reach them in your speech. But I want to give you a little word of encouragement. I know you read a lot of spiritual books, and I know you read a lot, uh, a lot of the Bible, but I'm going to encourage you one hour a day to read something other than the Bible. Read something other than about God. That will help open up your perspective of what's going on in the world and how people see, knowing that you are you were out there, but a different perspectives of people using 
principles, but biblical principles around God, how people ran, run businesses or how people operate in organizations. And he would give me a book to read. Or he would give me things to read. Um, so I read a lot of... Uh, I read a lot of Agatha Christie uh, while I was in, and um, I read, uh, as far as business is concerned, there was a business planning workshop in print, and I was able to use certain books uh, to read about business planning. Uh, I, I read a lot of Wall Street Journal. <laughs> mm-hmm. I kept contact with the Wall Street Journal um, papers that were coming in and reading the business sections. Mm-hmm. And uh, refamiliarizing myself with uh, business principles and and, and structure, uh, putting together my business plan while I was in, uh, incarcerated about the things that I really wanted to get into when I got out, and it was very mm-hmm. helpful. The, the, what that that sound advice he gave me was very helpful. Mm-hmm. So here we have our loving and merciful God, who you turn your life over to. He gave you favor, continue to give you favor, and allowed another person, a believer of the household of faith, who fell down, we all fall down, we have a right to get up. But he gave you some sound advice, because a lot of times, you know, we are, as you know, a lot of times we can be so heavenly minded and no earthly good. But here's a case where he's saying, balance it all out. And you really started that way when you begin to encourage fellow inmates to independently learn about the the election system and Mm, apply it elsewhere, like you talked about business and so forth. Now you are released from physical and spiritual prison, and you need a job, and you have that spiritual desire to continue growing in your faith. Brother Ron, what happened next? After release, I came out with nothing but my Bible and and a prayer. Uh, It's very important, and I want to say this, for those who are released to have some kind of support system um, when they get out. Uh, I think all support systems should be having foundation in Jesus Christ um, and nothing can work without seeking his will. Um, but it is, no but, however, it is important for those who are getting out to have some support system with people spiritually, physically, financially, um, feeding into them, investing in them for those who want to do right. There are people who get out who who want to go back Options, or who want to do something different, but they don't have a way, or an avenue, or have a, uh, 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 people leading them to say, "Hey, here's an option. Here's a path. This is what you can do." Especially people being down five, ten, fifteen, twenty years. That's a long mm-hmm. time to be in prison. Um, mm-hmm. To be out of society and not have a, you know, nothing to fall back on. Uh, so when I was in prison. A year and a half before I got out, even though I had a degree in psychology, it was a liberal arts degree, I said mm-hmm. to myself, I need I need to learn how to weld. And mm-hmm. I went into an apprentice uh welding uh program to get me a weld to get a welding certificate, certification mm-hmm. in welding. And I was in that program for a year. Mm-hmm. And I went from learning how to weld, being certified, and helping teach mm-hmm. while I was in there under, up under um, uh, the you know, um, the professor who who was running the welding shop in in prison, and that mm-hmm. was a blessing because I said to myself, if I don't, I'm not looking to be a psychologist or my degree working for me right away. I need mm-hmm. to learn how to use my hands, and God has given me the ability of, of activity of my limbs to be able to provide Mm -hmm. because I want to provide for my family. But God told me, Mm -hmm. I'll take care of your family if you take care of the things I have for you. So I have to Mm -hmm. put the kingdom first and he'll take care of my family. So I said, I trust you, but 
I'm gonna get this <laughs> with <the> certificate. <laughs> I'm gonna learn how to do this electrician apprenticeship. I'm gonna learn how to do this welding. And the funny thing is, it was open to anybody who wanted to learn. And a lot of the guys who were in there who would benefit from that didn't want to do it. Mm-hmm. And that bothered me. That bothered me. That bothered me to mm-hmm. know him. You know, uh, there were guys, you know, you got to get your GED. No, nah, I'm good. Or you got to learn how to take this class in order to do this. So God gave me, provided the money and opportunity to be able to take this welding apprenticeship. So what happened was you have to take this test, uh, this class first, and it's a six-month class before you get admitted into the program. Mm-hmm. And if I would if I would have done that, he would not have admitted, admitted me into the welding program if I would have, have got into the class because I wouldn't have had enough time. You have to have at least a year to get into the welding program because it's a, it's a year-long class. So mm-hmm. the only way in order for me to get admitted to this class is where my education comes into play. If I get 100 on the pretest before the class starts, mm. I had to get every question right on that pretest as it was about measurements, mm-hmm. math, solving problems, giving me welding things. If I got 100 on that test, he'll admit me to the class. But if I take the class after the class is over, I don't get – and, and I, don't, I have less than a year. I can't get into the welding program. I got 100 on that test. Oh, and right. I was able to get right into – I was able to get right into the welding program. Um, and, uh, yeah, so when I got out of prison, mm-hmm. I said, all right, God, I got this welding I looked for a job. I went through the Chicago Urban League. Chicago Urban League mm-hmm. was one of the best things that happened to me when I was getting out because they put me, mm-hmm. not only I was able to get forklift training in there, I was able to get different certifications, be put in contact with different uh, business leaders in the community, uh, mm-hmm. be put in contact with, man, it was such a blessing. But I still didn't have a job, but mm-hmm. God blessed me with a brother couple of friends uh, mm-hmm. who rolled with me while I was in prison to help be that support system that I needed while I was mm-hmm. in prison um, mm-hmm. to, to until I got on my feet. Do you not know mm-hmm. that the Lord kept me all through the time that I got out? I was six months in the halfway house with no job, looking for a welding job, discouraged by not finding one. And God kept me. I got into Moody Bible Institute. I got hired. This is see. This is the thing why I say God should be the foundation of everything. People put their trust in their degrees and their certifications and their own knowledge. Mm-hmm. And when that fails, they have mm-hmm. nothing else to turn to. Let me tell you what happened. Mm-hmm. I had got I, I got a hired in a job while at the Urban League, and they told me I went in there for the interview, and something happened in the interview. Where is that a guy came in, a supervisor, the supervisor of the person who was interviewing me, said they were having a problem out there on the floor. And he said, do you, I need, you know, I need to come up with a solution. So I interjected and said, why don't you try this? This may work if you do that. I had took the test and everything, passed it. Mm-hmm. They went out there and tried it and said, wow, mm-hmm. it worked. He mm-hmm. said, you passed the test. Great on the interview. We're looking for supervisors. I'll start mm-hmm. you off mm-hmm. at nineteen dollars an hour, but we need mm-hmm. a commitment mm-hmm. of sixty sixty dollars sixty hours a week. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. after three months, I'll hire you as a supervisor if everything goes well after your first ninety days because we get need we need somebody like you here. Man, I got so excited. God, I <laughs> thought God see I thought God had opened that door. I thought mm-hmm. it was God that did all of that, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm excited. I tell people I got hired. Everything's coming together. But mm-hmm. at the same time, while I was going to the Urban League, I had to take a bus past Moody Bible Institute, and it was just something that intrigued me. So I got off the bus and started mm-hmm. those wheels turning and, and, and getting into school. Mm-hmm. These people did not call me back. After they so-called hired me, mm, I took mm. I took the drug test, I passed the physical mm-hmm. test, I did that filled out the all the financial forms, my pay, mm-hmm. my direct deposit, 
And mm-hmm. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on them. They knew about my background because I learned how to weld while I was in prison. They knew mm-hmm. I, I was I was drug free. And I'm mm-hmm. wondering what's the holdup? You got people from the Urban League calling. You got people. I'm calling them. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? All the same. The same time, the doors are opening to Moody Bible Institute for me to become a seminary student. God let me know. How are you going to work city hours a week? Mm-hmm. Chasing that money when you told me you wanted to work for me and I got this for over you over here for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So those doors closed to the welding mm-hmm. position, to the job, and the doors opened for me to come to seminary. Mm-hmm. Now mind you, mind you, I have people telling me I don't need to go back to school, I need to get a job. Mm-hmm. People not knowing what it's like to be in my shoes of trusting mm-hmm. God and being out of prison telling me what I need to do. Although they kept their best interest, my best interest in their heart wanted me to do what's, you know, I had a daughter to take care of. I have these bills mm-hmm. that I take care of. Mm-hmm. And I'm trusting God to provide. And while mm-hmm. I'm in school, he provided a job for me. Um, he provided the avenues for me to be able to take care of what I needed to take care of, not wanting to need for anything. And I'm just thinking if I would have pushed the issue about the job, come to find out the guy who hired me got fired. And everybody mm-hmm. he hired had to be rehired, and the job had already been filled that I was going mm-hmm. for, and they didn't, they didn't let me know. They didn't let me know. Mm-hmm. And uh, God gave me a piece about where I was and what was going on that he had in his hand in my life. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that was that's a story within itself. So, listeners, <clears throat> you know this is a story. So here you have where Brother Ron had, uh, there was a pastor in his life who had worked in corrections. And he was telling him that God had a future plan for his life, you know. And at this time, here you got Brother Ron. He's passing uh, Moody Bible Institute daily. You're hearing his story, what happened next. But what is interesting is that Brother Ron just shared something that I talked about uh, in this morning's program. He, He talked about a door that appeared to be a door from God. It looked nice. It had everything that a person would assume was from God. But he learned right on time it was not of God. And I shared this morning, and I'm sure that there will be others who want to talk about it, that God had blessed me with 87 doors, 87. But I knew they were not the door God wanted me to go in. And so... Those of you who are just trying to live for God, walk for God, talk for God, I hope you're really listening to this sojourn, the testimony of Brother Ronald Clay. Brother Ronald, you're now in your third year of graduate school, and let's really become personal. Men and ladies, ladies and men, I know that you're listening to Brother Ronald's testimony. Brother Ron, did God also bless you with a Proverbs 31 woman? And how did you meet her? Mm. Oh, yeah, I knew that was coming. Um, (laughs) Well, uh, how did I meet her? Uh, Well, (laughs) wow. Uh, Where do I start? Okay, so I was married prior to my incarceration. Mm-hmm. And this is all relevant, so bear with me, listeners. It's all relevant, okay? Uh, and when I got incarcerated, my wife, my ex-wife, divorced me. Mm-hmm. And at the time, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't care. It was like, okay, I'm in prison for many years. You gotta do what you do. I was hurt by it. I was hoping she would have rolled with me, but she chose that she was going to take a different direction. We had a child together. I have a 13-year-old daughter. A daughter mm-hmm. with her, um, and I wanted to keep my family together, but I'm in prison, and she felt like she had to do what was best for her and her daughter, and mm-hmm. divorce would be the best thing. When I got saved, uh, I'm in the chapel watching a movie, and the name of the movie is called Fireproof. Mm-hmm. And God had put on my heart at that particular time on how I failed as a leader and the head of my household. Mm-hmm. And God had put on my heart that uh, um, that 
I had failed in my marriage. A lot of things in mm-hmm. my past that I felt like I had I had failed at, I always had a makeup. I was able to, mm-hmm. okay, I didn't graduate from Prairie View so I can finish elsewhere, but as long as I get my degree, there was no going back to my ex-wife. Mm-hmm. That door was, at the time, I felt was closed. Mm-hmm. So I got on my knees. I was crying. I said, Lord, forgive me for me not being who I was or who I mm-hmm. needed to be at that time in my life, Lord, mm-hmm. forgive me for that. Forgive me for not being the head of my household, the leader, um, the man I need to be for that woman and my family. And I need you to heal my heart from this pain. And I have a desire to have a woman in my life that you know who I need, you know what I need to provide mm-hmm. that because I have a desire to be that man for that woman. So fast forward, I get out of prison. And I was in a relationship when I first got out of prison, but that relationship wasn't of God. It was, it was, um, you know, it was something to do when I got out of prison, and it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't of God. And I was convicted mm-hmm. about that relationship. And here comes this woman at Moody Bible Institute, is where I left her at. I mean, I, I'm sorry, where I met her at. And mm-hmm. I never forget, it was not love at first sight. It was not love at first sight. It was we had an argument, uh, and she told me, you know, I hope what well, she said. I hope I never see this guy again. And my <laughs> words to her was, my words to her was, God bless the man that decides to marry you. <laughs> and <laughs> that's how we ended. Now, prior to that, uh, with my ex girlfriend before that, and it was a couple other girls that I was trying to go after while I was here at the school that didn't mm-hmm. work out. Mm-hmm. And I got fed up and tired. And I said, Lord, <laughs> I'm done looking for these, you know, this godly woman or whatever, so-called godly women. Uh, I'm just like spinning my head, right? Spinning, mm-hmm. you know, just going in circles. So there was this one time this, this friend of mine said, hey, we're going to go to this uh, gathering at a church. And I told her, hey, let's take this route. And she said, no, this is the best route. So we're going back and forth arguing about the route to take. And I said, you know what? Let's go your way because I'm just getting here. I'm just getting home, me getting used to public transportation. She's been here. I'm going to follow her lead and, you know, let her lead us the way. Let her lead the way. On my way to the train, I found $20. Mm-hmm. And I got an immediate revelation from that $20 I found. The Bible said, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. That mm-hmm. word findeth is, in the Hebrew, means to stumble upon. Mm-hmm. A lot of people go out looking, seeking for something, and that's finding too. But that word in that particular means to stumble on. Let me know that your focus should be on me. Mm-hmm. And not on this woman that you're looking mm-hmm. for. On mm-hmm. your way to seeking me, you will find or stumble upon that woman. I'm supposed mm-hmm. to focus. If I would have went out searching for that twenty dollars, I wouldn't have never found it. But it was mm-hmm. only because I was going the right way that I was supposed mm-hmm. to be going to my destination that I stumbled upon that twenty dollars. So mm-hmm. I said, you know what, Lord, you're right. My focus is going to be solely on you. My trust is going to be that you will provide. And not too long after that, I, again, I was not seeking the woman that I had at that particular time. I stumbled upon my wife. And it was a while before I realized that she was the one that I really wanted to and needed to be with. And it was a rough time me submitting to what God had for me but when I decided to finally mm-hmm. do so that door opened up and mm-hmm. I received what God had for me and we were married on uh, like I said 141 days ago and mm-hmm. it's been a blessing ever since congratulations to you and Natalie yes. congratulations Thank you. so you hearing listeners the word submissive Submitting, surrender. So God also assigned another brother of the household of faith, Scott, to walk along with you. Why is the both of your relationships important too? 
and for you, Natalie, and kingdom purposes? Why is that important? Um, one thing about having a godly woman who submitted to God, you know, she God would often often speak uh, through her or to her, and um, I would heed that that listening what, what God was trying to show me. I guess I wasn't. I was trying to do everything on my own. Was that she asked me, "Do you have an elder to speak into your life? Is mm-hmm. there somebody that is where you want to be when you get older?" Um, mm-hmm. In their in their walk with God, and that was a great question because before that there was nobody. When I got out of prison, there was nobody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was seeking after prominent ministers and pastors. Um, when she had told me that uh, through Moody that I had met to try to hey you know I want to learn how to preach I want to learn how to do this and that mm-hmm. and those doors those doors were closed. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that I was. Uh, going to get that in a certain way, in a certain manner, and in in a look a certain way, and it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening was, uh, Gary, I ended up getting a job at my school uh, Mm -hmm. as a software software electrician. Um, Mm -hmm. And this guy that came in the package that I didn't think would come in, let's just be honest, he was a 65-year-old white guy. And mm-hmm. I'm looking from trying to get the ushering and the mentoring and the, the elder and the mentorship from African Americans who were older. And mm-hmm. for one thing or another, when he tried to, you know, reach out to me, at first the doors were closed, and I started watching this man and his mm-hmm. spirit with his family and those around mm-hmm. him was very godly and he moved in a certain way that commanded, not demanded, but commanded certain respect. Mm-hmm. And right. he wanted to he wanted to bring me up under his wing. And mm-hmm. he reached out in so many ways. He every time before we worked, we would pray. That's and everything right. that I would bring to him before we started anything, it was about prayer. He would ask me what's going on in my life when I was pursuing mm-hmm. my wife. Mm -hmm. Um, He would tell me about what that meant was pursued because she was the first Christian woman of God that I actually pursued. Every woman Mm -hmm. before that wasn't. And there was a Mm -hmm. way that I needed to pursue her that would let her know not only did I love her, but that I love God. That's right. And I started to watch this guy, and the what he was giving me was not – had nothing to do with color. It had everything Mm -hmm. to do with the spirit. And the spirit in him was recognizing the spirit in me and leading me Mm -hmm. in a direction that was fruitful and beneficial in my ministry with my family and my daughter Mm -hmm. and with my future wife, with school and with work. Mm -hmm. And being up under him has been so beneficial for me uh, in so many ways that it has elevated my way of thinking, my way of praying, my way of fasting, my mm-hmm. way, way of walking, and mm-hmm. I'm still I'm still learning, I'm still walking. Mm-hmm. But that that relationship allowed me to usher in other relationships and opportunities, and uh, and, and allowed me to learn how to see God. And mm-hmm. it, it reminded me because I had my dad, but my dad is not around, and That's what my right. dad would have done. And would have been Scott to right. that void, and God right. gave me that relationship in order for that. Because my dad, and you know, it's 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 um, it's it's been dad's not around. I know he's with God, sleeping in the mm-hmm. bosom of the Father. I know that with all my heart. But I wish that you know I could have been here and him watching me go through this when he knew I was going to be. That's right. Him seeing this coming to fruition, but. God provided the That's spirit right. of my father in this man to give me what I needed, and, and That's right. I, I, every, I think every every babe in Christ should have an elder, you know, That's right. in Christ to help usher in to be able to know how to listen and heed to the spirit, um, right. and that has been beneficial in my life overall. That That's that really right. has. God has allowed an accountability partner to, to be there at the same time apart from your your, your wife. Uh, I reminded my pastor who he would always say, he said, Gary, you know, 
when you uh, apart from God letting your hair down, make sure that uh, uh, to Him, make sure you 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 let your hair down to your partner, your wife as well. And it's good that God has Brother Scott in and around you to give you that accountability that's needed. So God knew knows what you need. Brother Ron, as we head toward a wrap up, while looking back and moving forward, what powerful messages were, were was your parents trying to instill for you? Um, looking back, um <laughs> that's funny. I went to I was able to be blessed to go to the Holocaust Museum and um in uh, Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and there's a memento that I took from there uh, that they were selling and on a rock that has a car. As a car means to remember. And they want us to they never forget and to remember what had took place during that Holocaust. And that rock I brought back and I sit up there and it has a different meaning for me, although it's supposed to have a significant meaning from where I got it from. And a lot of the things that Scott is showing me, God is revealing to me, my father, my mother taught me, and I'm able to go back and remember these things and be reminded of the results of yielding to the spirit, yielding to the will of God, putting God first and foremost and him being the center of your life. Nothing is possible without him. Um, and, and you can do nothing from him. We were always, that scripture in John, you know, um, I'm, 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 I'm nothing without him. And without him, I can do nothing. I can do nothing without God. It's, it's That's right. That in itself, family, my real family are those who are like-minded in the body of Christ. They will teach right. me these things. That's right. And they were showing me these things. And because now as a man uh, with my own family and with my own responsibilities, I'm able to go back to see how my father and my mother ushered and showed me certain things and how they did and the results they yielded from that. Uh, though I'm, I'm, it's, it's a blessing that I'm able to go back and, and read scriptures to show, and oh, the Bible. Five disciplines of the faith they taught me. Fasting is important. Prayer is important. Fellowship is important. Giving is important. And studying the word is important. And those five disciplines of faith that my father and my mother gave me, um, that I'm able to resort back to in the word, is helping me right now. And those are the things my father and my mom instilled in me, that seed that they planted in me that has been able to be beneficial for me in my walk right now. Mm-hmm. So listeners, you're, you're hearing from brother Ronald Clay. We've been talking to someone who started off as a rebellious PK kid, becoming a rebellious federal prisoner. And then we heard how and what suddenly changed in his life. We see how he ended up at Moody Bible Institute as a third-year seminary student. We're listening to the spiritual battles that was real for his life. You know, battles that challenged his faith. Now that God has been with you, Brother Ron, leading you along the way to where you are now in life, what are you thankful for? Uh, I am very much thankful for life, health, strength, and peace of mind. Seriously. And what that means is uh, life, new life uh, in him. Uh, any in Christ, he's in creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things come new. My new life in Christ, uh, being able to not focus on the past and focus on my future. Uh, being able to, my future in Christ, not just on on earth, knowing that, uh, there's a future beyond the grave. There's a future in heaven uh, with the Father uh, and in the reign of the Son. So that life, that abundant eternal life, is what I'm I'm I'm, um, I'm grateful for. Uh, health, uh, life, health, and le- health is uh, is what I'm, I'm grateful for. A lot of people didn't wake up this morning, and I, every morning I get up grateful in um, in prayer, and, and thank you for uh, good health. 
um, and, and doing so, being a steward of my body and, and exercising, um, and watching what I eat, and being able to um, be grateful in those things by being a steward of the things that he's given me, uh, the strength. And knowing that I have that word uh, that I can go to, that I have the freedom to be able to read, uh, that's in my heart and my mind to 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 hold on to when things get tough and confusing at times, and a peace of mind that I never had before before um, the foundation of Christ came into my life, um, being able to know that no matter what. My trust and faith in God God has everything in his power And in his time And because of that Worrying about the things that I can't control uh, Would be useless So those things of which, what I, of which I'm most grateful for in my life Is, is, is profound Every day So Brother Ron as you look out, uh, not only uh, globally and in the United States and and where you are, and remembering the, but the pastor who had a renewal in the Lord had shared about not just from the spiritual perspective but down here on earth. As you look out from where you are and what you see and what you know, any final words for our listeners and how can others reach you for interviews? Um, one thing that I'm noticing in the world, the one thing that I'm really noticing is two things, two things that are holding uh, that I'm noticing that a lot of people are bothered by, but I'm not. The first thing is that I know that the world is getting worse. Um, the world is going down a dark path uh, of which they think is good, but trying to eliminate God out of the picture, there can be no good in it. Um, man wanting to do things on their own without God, it will. It's like a dog chasing his own tail. It will result in nothing. Um, uh, knowing that uh, there's hope in that because I know that this is temporary. And reading the book, the Bible, the, the book, the Bible, um, that we all know as Christians how the story ends. And understanding that and our hope in that and God allowing man to uh, run the world as it may As it is now To understand that he is coming To establish his kingdom And no matter how things look Knowing that and putting our hope In that um, I am so Thankful and grateful And I want my brothers and sisters to know With all that is going on In that hope We have something to look forward to In that hope we have something To be grateful for and that love and that revelation of God and how he's revealing uh, himself in his grace, there's a time coming where that we'll be caught up with him one day and reigning here on earth with him again um, with Christ. And I believe that. I wholeheartedly believe that. And I am so grateful for that hope in Jesus Christ, uh, that renewal of life that he's given me, and all my brothers and sisters in Christ out there, um, it's 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 a beautiful thing. And without him and that hope, I would be lost. I, I guarantee you I would not be here in where God has me right now. And just to be faithful, be faithful stewards over what he has given you and your time, talent, and your treasure, and giving him the glory and it's, and it's used for his will, his purpose for the advancement of the kingdom in his time and giving our glory and honor to God for that very thing of which we have our hope in, um, brothers and sisters in Christ, hold on. And for those who are listening who don't have Christ, Christ is the answer. And I'm so grateful for that. And if they would like to reach me, 
they can reach me on my email at mr mr d o c four one three at gmail dot com. I established that email when I got out of prison as a Mr. Disciple of Christ D O C Philippians four thirteen. I can do all things through Christ that strengthened me. So that's M R D O C four one three at Gmail dot com if they would like to reach me. And I thank you for the interview and the opportunity to be able to speak to the uh listeners out there, uh those brothers and sisters in Christ and those who who don't have Christ and have yet to yield it to the power of the Holy Spirit. And I appreciate this opportunity. Hey, Brother Ronald, it was an honor. It's an honor that God allowed uh, both of us, especially me, to have a chance to fellowship with you. For those of you listeners who are not familiar with Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, Illinois, Google it. See, see the history. See the history as it relates to here in the United States. That's very important. Learn. That's what Brother Ronald was talking about earlier. Learn. Learn about some of the colleges, some of the pastors who started those colleges. Mm-hmm. Well, Brother Ron, thank you for appearing on Challenges of Faith. Uh, return anytime you so desire. And please thank all those persons who made our interview possible. May our loving and merciful God continue to protect, lead, and guide you along with Scott, and most importantly, Natalie, your God-ordained soulmate. Mm. I want to leave, leave off with, um, before we head to a uh, closing uh, song, but I want to uh, leave off something for Natalie and Brother Ron. It's called God's Word for Women and the Men Who Love Them. When I mm. created the heavens and the earth, I smoked, I spoke them into being. When I created man, I formed him and breathed life into his nostrils. But you, woman, I fashioned after I breathed the breath of life into man because your nostrils are too delicate. I allowed a deep sleep to come over him so I could patiently and perfectly fashion you. Man was put to sleep so that he could not interfere with creativity. From one bone, I fashioned you. I chose the bone that protects man's life. I chose the rib which protects his heart and lungs and supports him as you are meant to do. Around this one bone, I shaped you. I modeled you. I created you perfectly and beautifully. Your characteristics are as the rib, strong yet delicate and fragile. You provide protection for the most delicate organ in man, his heart. His heart is the center of his being. His lungs hold the breath of life. The rib cage will allow itself to be broken before it will allow damage to the heart. Support him as the rib cage supports the body. You were not taken from his feet to be under him, nor were you taken from his head to be above him. You were taken from his side to stand beside him and be held close to his side. You're my perfect angel. You're my beautiful little girl. You've grown to be a splendid woman of excellence, and my eyes feel When I see the virtues in your heart, your eyes don't change them. Your lips, how lovely when they part in prayer. Your nose, so perfect in form. Your hands, so gentle to touch. I've caressed your face in your deepest sleep. I've held your heart close to mine. Of all that lives and breathes, you are most like me. Adam walked with me in the cool of the day, yet he was lonely. He could not see me or touch me. He could only feel me. So everything I wanted Adam to share and experience with me, I fast in you, all in you, my holiness, my strength, my purity, my love, my protection and support. You're special because you are an expression, an extension of me. Man represents my image, woman, my emotions, together, together, together. You represent the totality of God. So man, treat woman well, treat women well, love her, respect her, for she is fragile. And hurting her, you hurt me. What you do to her, you do to me, and crushing her. You only damage your own heart, the heart of your father, and the heart of her father. Women support your man in humility. Show him the power of emotion I have given you. In gentle quietness, show your strength. In love, show him that you are the rib that protects his inner self. Did you not know that woman, that you are special in God's sight? That was submitted by an unknown author called Proverbs 31 Woman.
that's also applicable to the man. And that I dedicate, mm. Brother Ron, to both you and Sister Natalie. Thank you for taking the time to come on Challenges in Faith. Know that you love and appreciate it, and please stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much. Listeners, did you hear the specific messages about rebellion, listening to parents, being a man, gangs, crime, emotion, surrendering to God, obeying God, speaking to others about God, studying, applying the word of God, mentors, friends, recognizing that, you know, there are 99 people out there of either gender. You don't have to go through 99 to get to the one. Did you hear Brother Ron talk about soulmate, school? Listen to the messages that God would have you to listen to today, tonight, for you.